Our second Bible passage where we argue that Jesus affirms purgatory is Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. We read, And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Traditionally, the unpardonable sin refers to final impenitence, where an individual refuses God's mercy until death, as taught by the Catechism in paragraph 1864. But rest assured that, according to the Catechism in paragraph 982, as long as someone turns away from sin and his repentance is honest, God will forgive him. The Catechism states, there is no offense, however serious, that the church cannot forgive. Setting aside the question of what the unforgivable sin is, Catholics who appeal to this passage highlight Jesus' implication. There are some sins that can be forgiven in the age to come, or the afterlife. Pope St. Gregory the Great, in his dialogues, says, from this sentence, we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain others in the age to come. The Catechism of the Catholic Church uses this quote from Pope St. Gregory as support for its definition of purgatory as a post-mortem final purification of the elect in paragraph 1031. Since purgatory involves the post-mortem forgiveness of the guilt of remaining venial sins, along with the purification of any remnants of past forgiven venial or mortal sins, some conclude that Jesus affirms the existence of purgatory. But how do we know that Jesus intends the age to come to refer to the afterlife? And why should we think Jesus intends to imply that sins can be forgiven there? Moreover, how do Christians who don't see this as a reference to purgatory read this passage? We'll consider these questions in this lesson and over the next few lessons. There are good reasons to think the age that Jesus refers to is the afterlife. One is that Jesus uses the age to come elsewhere in the Gospels in, the, in this way. Consider, for example, Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 30. You can see also Luke chapter 18, verse 30, where Jesus says, those who leave house, brother, sister, mother, father, and land for his sake will receive a hundredfold return in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus speaks of this time and the age to come as two distinct states of existence, this life and the next, both of which consist of people receiving rewards for giving up everything for him. Similarly, in Luke chapter 20, verses 34 through 35, Jesus speaks of this age as referring to this life, when men marry, and that age as the afterlife, when men do not marry. Jesus clearly intends this distinction to be taken literally, conveying a truth about the age to come. Namely, there is no marriage. And Jesus can't be referring merely to an age in the future at the end of time because souls in the afterlife right now do not marry. A second clue that the age to come likely refers to the afterlife is that just a few verses later, verse 36, Jesus speaks of the day of judgment, which, according to Hebrews 9.27, comes after death. And he speaks of it in connection with his previous warning about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. That's verses 36 through 37 of Matthew chapter 12. Now that we have good reason to think Jesus intends the age to come to refer to the afterlife, what about the implication that sins can be forgiven there? The reasoning is pretty straightforward. There would be no need for Jesus to exclude the sin against the Holy Spirit from being forgiven in the age to come unless it were possible that some sins could be forgiven in that age. 
Since Jesus does mention the theoretical possibility of sins being forgiven in the next life, we can conclude it's possible for sins to be forgiven there. And that possibility would become actual if a saved soul departs from the body with the guilt of unrepented venial sins, since nothing defiled can enter heaven, as we've seen in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. So what do we have? We have a state of existence after death wherein it's possible for a soul to be forgiven of its sins. And in light of the Old Testament tradition, for example, in Psalm 66, 10 through 12, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4, and chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, and Paul's writings, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, when someone is forgiven of sins, the forgiveness is described as purgation or purification. This postmortem purifying state can't be heaven, since there are no sins in heaven. It can't be hell, since no souls in hell can have their sins forgiven and be saved. So what is it? It's purgatory. If you enjoyed learning how to explain and defend our Catholic faith, make sure you check out the School of Apologetics. In our self-paced courses, Jimmy Aiken teaches the fundamentals of apologetic dialogue. Trent Horn shows how to defend life beginning at conception. On top of that, other trusted experts give courses on church history, creation, purgatory, the saints, and more. Sign up today because a faith you can defend is a faith you can own and embrace. Schoolofapologetics.com